Well, good morning, Cornerstone. It is my special privilege to introduce a very special and dear friend of mine. This is Shelby. Shelby is from my hometown, Bossier City, Louisiana, and I'm honored that she would join us today. She's actually a worship leader at Lifewater Church um, in our hometown, and she's also a worship major at East Texas Baptist University. Um, I'm, I'm honored for y'all to experience her worship. Um, there's many things I could say about her, but my favorite thing about Shelby is that you don't have to be in the room with her to experience the Jesus in her. Her heart is beautiful. It's pure. It comes through through her worship, and I'm excited for y'all to experience it with us today. So I honor you, my sweet friend. I'm so proud of you and all that you are doing. So join us in worship this morning. Oh 
Cornerstone family, my name is Lisette and I serve in the kids ministry. And I'm Maddie and I serve as a worship leader. We are so excited to have you with us online this morning. We wanna give a special shout out to our worship team for cultivating an atmosphere of worship in our homes. And we also wanna thank Shelby for being with us today and singing one of her original songs. If you wanna find one of her original songs, you can check her out on iTunes or on Spotify. Today we're gonna to be hearing from Pastor Dan as we get in for our week five of Reform the Norm. We are so blessed to have him and as he's been so diligent, strong, and such a gracious leader. Cornerstone, we are starting our host parties. Remember, because of COVID, it has to be 10 people or less, but if you're at risk, you can email us and we can definitely find something for you. If you're interested in going to a watch party, email us at info at cornerstoneatx.com and we'll have a host reach out to you. Have a great week, you guys. Good morning, my name is Dan Underhill and I am the pastor of Cornerstone Church. And we're so glad that you joined us today to continue our series called Reform the Norm. You know, this has been a fun series to kind of think about reforming what we believe to be the normal. And we've been talking a lot about how we don't want to go back to normal. We want to actually move forward. When I think back on things in my life, I noticed something. I remember them way better than they actually were. My memory of a thing is often better than the actual thing. Let me give you an example. We say that we like the old days. We like the, thing, the way things used to be. That's not true. Think about watching a movie today from your home because we all know theaters are closed right now. In order to watch a movie, you probably are going to stream it from one of your apps, whether it's Apple TV, whether it's Netflix, whatever platform. That is the way that you'd watch it now. If you went back to the way it used to be before that, you have to have a DVD. It probably would get scratched and you'd have to blow it off and see if you could wipe it off and see if you could get it to work. Or if you go further back from DVDs, you go to VHS tapes. And those, those were a nightmare. The quality was terrible. They were horrible as far as how clear the picture was, how clear the sound was. And if you go back even further, there was a time where you couldn't even just have those at ease in your home. You couldn't choose from a menu. You'd have to get in your car. You'd have to drive to a place where you could rent the videotape. You could sign your name, carry it out, and bring it home, watch it, make sure you rewind it and then you bring it back. And I think we need to rewind the way we think. We need to back up the way we think and say, look, the things that used to be, they're probably not as good as we remember them being. And we need to be willing to move forward. So in today's segment of reforming the norm, we wanna talk about how we handle problems and the way we may have used to handle them is not a good way to move them forward. And in order to reform the normal way of dealing with conflict or problems, we have to find out how does God view those conflicts? How does God view those problems? And I wanna walk you through a little bit of how he lays out in his word for you to deal with those situations. You see, if we think the right way to handle it is what other people think, how they'll view it, or what their opinion is about it, we're set up for failure from the beginning. But if we start from a position of, how does God view this? What does he want to do in it? And how does he want to work through it? Then we're set up for so much more success to be able to actually solve the problems that we're facing. And he has a specific approach. He has a way in which he deals with it. We're gonna find it later on in Matthew 18, a little further on than what we read last week. But here's what I wanted to start with. We have to reform the way we deal with problems by working from the outside in. Instead, we have to work from the inside out. What I mean by that is this. 
we have to recognize where those problems originate and where they come from. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2, I'm sorry, Ephesians 6, verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And so we can tell right there, God is telling us, your conflict may visibly be with the person that's in front of you, but it's not with them. It's good versus evil. It's right versus wrong. It is the age-old battle of sin and good and righteousness. That's the battle that's happening. So when we start engaging in a conflict, we have to start from the premise that we are not wrestling against the person that we have the problem or the hurdle with. This is a spiritual problem. No matter what it is, its foundation is spiritual because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. When we start from that position, it changes our stance. We don't have to be in a defensive posture. We realize that we can move things forward because this person is not my enemy. This person is not my opponent. This person is actually one of God's children. And I get the opportunity to reflect him to them through the situation. And so we need to start working on these situations from the inside out. Instead of letting our flesh rise up, instead of our, our pride, instead of our humanity and our brokenness to lead the way inside of conflict, what if we let our spirit lead the way? What if we let the sensitivity to what God is trying to do in their life lead the way. That would change our whole approach. And when we start from the inside out, there's a specific way that God talks about doing that. And it's found in Psalm 139, verse 23. This is what it says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. In another translation, it says this. Search me and know me and see if there's any wicked way in me. And when we start with any conflict with somebody else or a situation, and we say, God, would you search me and show me what's wrong inside of me first? We then can approach the situation with much better clarity, with much better accuracy, and our ability to solve the problem goes up exponentially. And we need to approach it from a position of, what is my portion in this? What is it that's wrong inside of me in the way I'm viewing this? Is it the lens in which I hear it? Is it my cultural norm that is skewing the way I view this? Was it my context? Is it what's around me? Is it the volume? What is it? And when we start from there, we can get so much further by starting from that position of ownership and responsibility, saying, God, show me first. Then as we approach the situation, we can see it from his perspective, not ours. Next, the goal absolutely must be restoration. Whenever you approach a problem, Whenever you approach conflict, the goal has to be restoration. If the goal is just to fight, what good is that? We literally have industries that are for that. It's called the UFC. It's called boxing, right? We don't need that in our homes. We don't need the UFC in our streets. We don't need that in our schools, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. We can watch that on pay-per-view. We can watch that on YouTube. That's great for entertainment. It's terrible for relationship. Again, good for entertainment with professional athletes, but terrible for relationships. So our goal can't be just to fight, just to fight. Our goal needs to be restoration. 
and healing and putting things back together. In fact, Galatians 6, 1 says this, Brothers, if anybody is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch over yourself, lest you be tempted. How different would our marriages be if we put this into play? How different would our family relationships be if we put this into play? How different would our work situations be or our school situations be? If we put this into play, it's my job as a spiritual man to restore. And he even clarifies how I restore with gentleness. Not beating them over the head with a Bible, not judging and condemning. We don't need any more of that. Put the bullhorn down. We don't need it. But we do need men. We do need women who love people and see them as God's children and want to bring them back to where God intended them to be. And that's our job. That's what we get to do. We get to restore what's been broken, what's been fractured in the way we handle conflict. The normal way is you offended me. Now I'm mad. Now I yell. Now I fight. And I fight until I win and you lose. I win, you lose. In that equation, we all lose. What if we change the equation? What if we change our approach and said, I will humble myself. I will serve and I'll be gentle. And I don't have to win. As long as he wins, we win. And when he wins and we win, everybody wins and everything works so much better in all of our lives. Maybe we should change that formula. Maybe we should challenge the way we see things. Maybe we should challenge the way we approach conflict or problems. Because the normal way of doing it isn't working. Let's be honest. Normal is broken. Normal is divisive. Normal is creating anxiety and tension at a rapid rate. We don't need any more of that. What we need is restoration. What we need is reformation. Reforming the way that God intended for it to be. So let's keep going. The third point I would say is if we are going to change the way we look at problems, we must begin to assume the best and not the worst. I think that's a lot of my problem. I start from a position of assuming that they're out to get me. Don't we do that as people? Like we assume in some ways that this person is not going to tell the truth. We assume that they're going to fail us because others have failed us in our past. But when we start with that perspective, we're setting the person up for failure. We're actually projecting our conflict onto that person. Why would we be surprised when we then have to face that conflict? And here's what we say, I knew it. I knew they'd let me down. I knew they'd fail me. Maybe, our perspective set up the entire situation for its desired results. What if we changed the way we looked at it? What if we assumed the best of the person? When someone tells you that somebody said something about you and it doesn't sound like them, why not go talk to them? Why not say, it doesn't seem right, instead of, I can't believe they said that about me wait a minute, let me go back to the person. In fact, in Matthew chapter 18, God lays out a whole plan for exactly how to deal with conflict. This is what it says, starting in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, 
go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Stop right there. If we just did that, 50% of problems would go away. But we don't. When someone does something that aggravates us, we go tell somebody else about it. We don't go back to them. And the person we go to can't solve it. They're incapable of being able to solve the problem between you and somebody else. So you're going back to the wrong source to even start it. No wonder we can't solve it. There's no ability to whatsoever. But let's keep going. It says, if he listens, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, this, what this doesn't mean is, now it didn't work out. We go get a gang, and now we go get them. Not at all. We start with assuming the best. We go to them. We deal with the situation. Sometimes it doesn't work. Maybe we can bring somebody else who knows and loves them to the situation and knows that they want to do what's right. Someone else who understands them. Somebody else who's invested in them. Somebody else who loves them. And then they can see, oh, there's two of you. This is the second time the issue's coming to me. Maybe there's a way I need to rethink this. If we did this process, if we instituted this process in the way we deal with conflict, how much of our conflict would be resolved faster? Instead of letting residual bitterness build up. And the truth is, there are many of us who are listening today that we're still bitter and angry about things that happened to us way in the past because we never resolved it. We never took the time to go back to the person and say, this hurt, this upset me, this frustrated me. Is this what you meant? Because this is what it felt like. We don't do that because we're insecure. We're insecure and we don't want them to tell us the truth about us. So we bury it, we act like it doesn't affect us, and then it slowly eats us and erodes us away from the inside out. It eats at us and it tears us up and then bitterness can take root. And there's no room for bitterness in the kingdom of God. We can't move forward. So even where you are right now, Maybe there's somebody you need to forgive. You know, the scripture tells us, forgive and it'll be forgiven of you. But if you don't, then it won't. Maybe there's things you need to let go of. I heard it said this way. They said, holding on to past hurts is like lighting yourself on fire and hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. I thought that was a great illustration. I was like, that just seems so foolish. But the truth is, many of us do it because we're not willing to confront the problem. We're not willing to confront the problem because we have too much pride. That pride is what's stopping movement in the kingdom of God. The rest of the scripture does go on here, and it continues to go on. If you refuse to listen to them, both of them, then tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen to the church, then let him, uh, let him, just let him go. Just move on. Just go on with it. Instead, what we often see inside of our churches is we share the holy prayer request. We share, oh, I just feel bad for them because they're really struggling. What if we just stopped sharing those and went to each other and said, how can I help? What can I do? Is there something I did? Is there a way I can believe in you? Is there a way that I can help this situation? Is there something I did that I can take responsibility for? And then if I'm spiritual, I'm there to restore it. But I've taken stock and said, you know what? I'm going to assume the best of other people instead of assuming the worst. I think that would change the way our cultures live.
Imagine if we put this in place. There would be no road rage. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> there would be a lot less conflict, right? There would be a lot less problems in our community if we learn to start doing things the way God intended for them to be done. If we follow his word, we'll know his ways. But if we don't read his word, if we don't follow his word, and we don't spend the time, how are we going to know the way? And our job is to be a guide for those who have gotten lost for those that have wandered away from their Heavenly Father. That's the great responsibility that we get. We get to be those kind of people, to restore gently, to bring them back. Because let's be honest, isn't that what someone did for us? Isn't that what happened in our lives? Someone did that for us first. His name is Jesus. And he hung on a tree called Calvary and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They know not what they do, the scripture says. And he really says, don't hold it against them. Charge it to my account. Man, that's next level. That's deep. When we start to live inside of forgiveness, when we start to live inside of restoration, we breathe hope. And that hope is Jesus Christ. That hope is the hope of the world, his church. That hope changes the landscape of how we live. And I don't know about you, but that's the message I want to live. Not breathing fire, but breathing hope. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I ask right now that any person that is listening could hear your love, could feel your forgiveness, and Lord, they would embrace your hope and your change. I pray your blessing on them, that God, you would watch over, you would keep them, you would bless them, you would be gracious to them. God, you would smile on them. Lord, that you would give them rest and you would give them peace. You would give them wisdom. You would give them vision to be who you've called us to be so we can spread your love, your joy, and your laughter on your earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again.